I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. We're here on another Monday, and as you might have noticed, the beginning bumper at the front end of the show is a little bit different than it has been in the past. This awesome graphic was done by Jesse Matson over at jessematson.com. Does excellent, excellent work. If you guys have any need of motion graphic type stuff, uh, go over and give Jesse a holler and find out what he can do for you. Now on with the show today. Uh, we are starting to get ready for the Precision Rifle Series match at Woody's in North Carolina next month. So we're making sure all our gear is checked out and ready to go. And I thought you guys might want to take a look at what I do to get ready for these kind of matches. Uh, the first thing that I concentrate on when I start getting ready for the match is the rifle. And the rifle I'll be shooting at Woody's right now is the Accuracy International AE Mark II. I've been shooting this rifle for quite some time now. I'm very, very uh, well suited to it. Uh, I've spent a whole bunch of time behind it so it really becomes like an extension of my body. I'm used to where all the controls are, uh, used to how the bolt feels on it and how it operates. Uh, that's really a first and foremost concern. You don't want to roll into a high-level match with gear that you're not very familiar with. You go in there with a new rifle, maybe something you haven't run in real well. Uh, you may run into problems, and problems when you're already in a stressful competition environment really don't work well. Uh, it's a whole lot harder to diagnose something in a precision rifle match than it is just goofing around on your home range. Now, some of you guys recognize this rifle. You've seen it quite a few times before, but for those of you that haven't, I will go through the different setup on the rifle and what the different components are. Now, first and foremost, this is an Accuracy International AE Mark II rifle. It's not a chassis system. The rifle, receiver, chassis, it's all designed to work together. You can build a rifle very similar to this using a Remington 700 Action on an Accuracy International chassis, but you get a couple of different advantages when you have the full rifle like this. Uh, the biggest advantage is the Accuracy International receiver and bolt. The AE receiver is greatly overbuilt when you compare it to a Remington 700. The receiver walls are much thicker, and the way the bolt locks up is considerably different. Uh, Remington 700 is a two lug bolt and it has to rotate 90 degrees to lock up. With the Accuracy International AE Mark II, you get a three lug bolt. So there are three different lugs that are spreading out the force and the bolt handle only has to drop 60 degrees to lock down. That gives you a little bit quicker bolt manipulation and it just overall gives you a better feel. The design of the bolt lugs in the AE Mark II gives you a little extra force when you are camming that bolt handle down. So if you get around this a little bit sticky, a little gritty, or maybe you didn't quite get one size down small enough, when you crank that bolt handle down, you can actually do a little bit of resizing with the chamber. Uh, that's not an ideal situation, but being able to crush around down a couple of thousands and still actually fire it and get the points for it versus having the rifle not actually be able to chamber and have to do a malfunction drill, uh, that means a little bit. Also, when you start to get grit and nastiness blown in there, snow, ice, water, uh, the AE functions a little bit better than a Remington 700 because you have that little bit of extra force. The AE also has some really interesting features to it that allow it to work better in a nasty environment. For one thing, the bolt is fluted, but it's not fluted like the pretty bolts that you see on custom rifles. Uh, we're pretty used to seeing these neat helical flutes on uh, Remington 700 custom bolts. Well, on the AE Mark II, the actual part of the bolt that you see through the ejection port is smooth. Where it's fluted is back here where it rides in the action. And what that does is it gives dirt and grit and mud a place to build up so that you still get smooth bolt manipulation. So that's pretty nice. It's not in a place where blowing wind will cause the grit to collect in the flutes and then when you pull the bolt back, it pulls the dirt into the action. The, when the action is closed, the flutes are protected, but when you start moving the bolt, the flutes just give dirt a place to go. So that's something really nice. 
we've got a heavy duty bolt stop on it so when you really slam that bolt to the rear um, it gets caught bolt doesn't come flying out whereas on the remingtons you just have a really small piece of sheet metal that is stopping that bolt and sometimes that can get stuck down and then you can run into problems as you notice the ae mark ii this ae mark ii is equipped with a folding stock and when we start getting into the 26 inch long barrels the folding stock allows us just to fold it down a little bit more compact for travel uh, it really doesn't make a difference in actual shooting other than the fact that the stock locks up extremely tightly so we don't have to worry about it bouncing around and rattling now as we come back to the back of the rifle, you'll notice that we have a little spacer in here. The spacer is an AccuStack, and this comes from Victor Company USA. We'll leave a link down below. And while we have quick adjustable knobs on this to lock the cheek piece in, these knobs do stick out a little bit and they can get caught and they can roll. And when they do, if you're in the middle of shooting and you drag something, a sling or a rock, or you drag it across your uh, body, you can roll these loose and all of a sudden your comb drops down and you lose your sight picture. So it's nice to have these little uh, risers in here. You can use the thumb wheels to get your height dialed in and then you can go back in and you can drop these spacers in. You can figure out how many spacers you need, drop them in there and have a really, really solid comb and not worry about that collapsing on you. Now I did put the thumb wheels in originally when this uh, stock came in. Instead of thumb screws you just had regular uh, allen head screws in there and you can torque those down pretty good and not worry about this moving but if they do it's not something you really want to lock tight in and if they do loosen up on you they're going to drop down and you're going to have to bust out a tool in the field to dial it in. So I do prefer the thumb screws and the AccuStack risers in there as a combination to solve that problem. Now the AE Mark II comes with a really, really nice uh, two-stage adjustable trigger. Verify the weapon is clear. And by two-stage trigger, you've got your first stage take up where nothing's going on, the rifle's not firing. Once you hit that first stage take up, you have a very short and crisp second stage for the rifle to fire. I really like this two-stage trigger when you're shooting matches because it allows you to index the trigger and you know when the rifle's getting ready to fire. If it's a nasty match where you're wearing gloves, then you have that ability to stage the trigger when you're prepared to fire and your sights are on target and then you know that last little bit of motion is going to fire the trigger. So just my preference, a lot of guys run single-stage triggers. I really do like the... Uh, two-stage trigger that Accuracy International includes on here. And it is fully adjustable, but we've still left it at the factory setting because that just works pretty well for us. The rest of the features on the rifle are regular AICS chassis features. We use AICS magazines. I have a five-round uh, magazine inserted in here right now. It does accept 10-round magazines, and usually during a match, I will run 10-round magazines in it just so I have that ability. Uh, the five round magazine works okay. If I have to shoot an offhand stage, then I may use the five round magazine just so I've got a little bit more uh, ability to move my hand back towards the back of the rifle without hitting that magazine. Um, when I'm shooting anything else, especially barricade stages, I like the 10 round magazine because it sticks down. It gives me a lip that I can drive into the barricade. Uh, that's my shooting style. You want to make sure that your rifle will function reliably if you decide to press the magazine against a barricade. Some uh, rifles that are built on Remington 700 platforms and have various different inlets and various different magazine systems, if you get a little bit of pressure on that magazine and it cocks a little bit in the magazine well, then you can have malfunctions when you try to feed that next round in. So keep that in mind and test it out and make sure yours works fine. Coming forward, we have a Atlas version 8 point, or actually this is a version 8 bipod, not the 8.1. Uh, Atlas version 8 bipod on an AI spigot mount. So it does mount right into the factory AI spigot in the front of the rifle. It's a very solid setup. Uh, it allows me to quickly remove it if I want to kick the whole bipod loose to shoot an offhand stage or if I have some reason why I don't want the bipod on there. Maybe I'm shooting across a pack. Uh, 
I can kick the legs forward 45, I can kick them back 45, or I can have them straight up and down. So it gives me quite a few uh, different options uh, with this bipod. Some guys like the Harris. If you like the Harris, Harris shoots fine. I could attach a Harris on here uh, with the standard um, sling stud attachment, or I can drop a rail in here and throw a Harris back on on a rail. I just prefer the Atlas bipods. Again, it comes down to a personal preference. Now, when we come out front here, you'll see this telephone pole that's sticking out here is actually a Krieger barrel. I believe it's a number 10 contour, but don't hold me to that. It's about uh, one and a quarter inch back here at the breech end, and it tapers down to about nine tenths of an inch at the muzzle, and it's finished at 26 inches with a recessed target crown. Now, this is a very heavy barrel. Uh, it's really heavier than I normally like to use, but what happened last year is we ran into a crunch where we needed the barrel quickly, and Mile High actually had this barrel in stock. Uh, they were able to get it to us rapidly. In fact, we had it in our hands in about a week, which is phenomenal for a match grade barrel. Uh, this barrel is chambered in 243, and it works very well for what we need to do. This barrel is an absolute laser. It is a little heavier than I like. I think it's quite a bit heavier than you need for a 243, but there's no uh, no arguing with results. So we'll continue to shoot it until we shoot it out. I have no desire to go back and flute it or turn it down because that may affect the ultimate accuracy on it. Uh, Krieger makes a very, very nice barrel and this one has worked great for us. Now we are sticking with 243 right now because we just ran down to a time crunch and I don't have time to work up a totally new rifle before this match. What you may see is after Woody's, you say, may see me switch back over to a 260. Uh, we've been working with 260 and a lot of matches have started limiting the speed limit on cartridges. They want you to keep them under 3,100 or under 3,000 foot per second depending upon the individual match director. Part of the reason for that is steel. A lot of these matches, they use borrowed steel or uh, you know they just gather together steel from the members in the area and they don't want you punching holes through their steel because when you start getting close up I can run the 107 grain match kings through this barrel at pretty close to 3400 foot per second without really seeing pressure signs on an average day I may see pressure signs if I'm running that hot on a hot day but on an average day I can crank them out there and that is putting a lot of force on the target you can start to damage some uh, lower end steel targets at that speed so they start slapping speed limits on it, and when you start cranking down the speed of a 243, you start to lose some of the advantage of the cartridge. So with the 260, I can run a higher BC bullet, and I can run it fast to still take advantage of that high BC. So you may see us move away from the 243 later on this year, but we'll have to see how it goes. We've got a rifle that is being built right now. And when we get that barrel to action back, we'll talk about the way that we're going to set up that rifle for the next match and go through verifying it to make sure it is capable of shooting a match. Now we'll come back to the rifle scope. Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. This is the Vortex Razor HD 5 to 20 power scope. I've run this scope quite a bit. I have a lot of faith in it. It works very well. It's very clear glass. Uh, the scope runs around the $2,000 price range. These have been out for a while now, so you may be able to see them on the used market for a little bit less than that. This one really has been beat up. The turrets are kind of rashed up on it because it's gotten uh, banged around on barricades. It's rolled off the shooting tables before. It's got scratches up here from barricades and from uh, different shooting positions, but it just really works well. The 5 to 20 power is a great power range. It has the EBR2 reticle in it, so it has an open center, but a very, very fine open center. And then it has wind hold dots in kind of the Christmas tree pattern that come down the sides. The reticle uh, elevation marks are marked so it's really easy to see when you need to hold on a target where you're holding at and overall it's just a really good option these are five mil per rev turrets 
and I actually like these turrets a little bit better than the Razer 10 mil per rep turrets because the clicks are a little bit further apart. And when I'm actually going through trying to get it dialed in specifically, um, it is harder to overshoot a setting than it is with 10 mil per rev. Uh, 10 mil per rev, I find myself kind of overshooting every now and again. So I like the five or the uh, five mil per rev turrets, and I like the distance between the tenth mil clicks on these. And to be honest, with a 243, you're really losing some of the utility of a 10 mil per rev um, turret. Windage turrets, same thing. They work just fine. Uh, the only thing that I dislike about the Razer HD's turret, at least this version, is that it doesn't have the left or right markings facing the shooter. Uh, you, you go one, two, three, four, one direction, one, two, three, four, the other direction, um, all the way, actually, I say two, three, four, it actually only goes to 2.5 before it starts to reset for the other side. But I like windage turrets that have one R or one L, two R, two L, etc. That way it's really easy at a glance for me to see if I'm on the right or left revolution instead of trying to figure out where the zero is at. Not a great big problem because I usually am not dialing for windage, I'm usually holding, but should I need to dial for it because it's a complex situation or I've got a very high wind, then I like to be able to see those left and right markings. The power selector ring moves fairly freely. It's really easy for me to get it cranked into a power or to crank over to another power if I need to. I haven't seen a reason to put a cattail on this. I see a lot of guys have been doing that here lately so that they can slip back and forth between magnifications quickly. On a stage, I'm usually not doing that. I will usually take a look at the stage beforehand, get a good idea on what magnification I need to set dial it in and pretty much stick with that throughout the stage. The parallax is really easy to adjust, good to dial in quickly. We don't have a whole lot of problems with that. This scope does have a fast focus eyepiece and as you can see here, I have taped up the fast focus eyepiece. I got it dialed in to where I wanted, wrapped a couple of wraps of electrical tape around it. I can still stick a scope cap over top of it if I want to and not have a problem. The main reason that I put the electrical tape wrap on there is because with my Butler Creek cap on this, it's very easy to knock the cap to one side or the other and turn your ocular focus off. So with the tape, I don't have that problem. If I bump the scope cap, then the scope cap is going to turn and it's going to leave my focus alone. You'll see I don't have a scope cap on the back of this right now. It's because I busted it. Um, it happens every now and again, you'll get that cap that'll pop open while it's in the bag or in transit and you'll hit it and it'll crack off. Uh, that one broke off and I just haven't had a chance to replace it yet. I keep an ocular cap on here because that's the larger piece of glass that I have to worry about. And I'd like to keep the sun from shining through if I put it muzzle up in a rack. But I haven't been so worried about the ocular. I probably need to get a cap on here just to keep the dust and grit out of it. But so far, it really hasn't been a problem. Um, lastly, on the back side of this, I have got a uh, sling on here. This is a sling of my own design. Uh, maybe you'll see these coming out in the next year or so. I haven't really got a specific date on it yet. And because there are guys out there that like to copy everything, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, other than to tell you it is a precision rifle sling. It's designed specifically to be able to use as a loop sling and as a carry sling. Um, but it's got a couple of other little tricks up its sleeve. And when we get closer to bringing these out in production, then I'll talk a little bit more about it. The sling clips on very easily, really easy to use, really easy to adjust. I've got opposite sling mounting points on this chassis if I want to switch sides. If for some reason a match director decides to um, get really devious and make you shoot slung from the support side, then I can switch things over and I can do so. I'm very big on these rifles of making them as ambidextrous as possible. Obviously I can't do anything about the bolt handle, uh, but I like to be able to run the gun from either side 
if uh, we get a situation where that's necessary. Um, one piece that I forgot to mention was the scope mount. This is a Bobro Engineering Precision Rifle mount. It uses two throw levers, and I'll pop it off here just a second so you can see it. Uh, uses two throw levers where no, most of the Bobro mounts just have one, and it is a great mount. It returns to zero very well. And one of the reasons I've been running this mount on this setup is because I need to remove the scope from the rifle when I change the barrels over. Uh, it just uh, it doesn't work well with our barrel vise to try to do it with the scope in place, and you run the risk of damaging the scope because you could have the uh, the action wrench contact the scope turrets. So it's better just to get it off and get it out of the way. And the Bobro mount lets me pop it off, pop it back on, and have a good return to zero on it. It's just one less thing that I have to worry about torquing down, because when you snap these levers down, they're good to go. One of the few things I dislike about it is if you're not careful and you try to just do a one-handed uh, flip on the lever, that lever will slap your thumb pretty good. So you have to be careful with them. Uh, those spring levers are under quite a bit of pressure and they will uh, zap you. It's not going to injure you, it's just not real comfortable. Overall, that is the rifle as it's set up. As you're looking at it right here with an empty five round magazine, this rifle's about 19 and a half pounds. Um, as I said, I really would prefer a lighter weight barrel, but this is what we have to roll with. I can still shoot this rifle offhand with the aid of a sling. I don't know that I would try to do it without the sling. The uh, rest of the setup is uh, pretty basic. That's all for the rifle right now. If you guys have questions or comments on the rifle or why I set it up in a certain manner that I have, then please go ahead and leave it in the comment section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. As we go along next week, we will talk about some of the other gear. I'll pick another piece of gear that we're going to take out there. And I will also talk to you guys on how I roll my match hand loads for this rifle and what processes I go through on those so you guys can take a look at what I do or what I don't do on my match ammunition. That's it for this week. As I said, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below or on Facebook or Twitter. If you've liked this episode, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. If you want some motion graphics, make sure you head over to Jesse's site and thank him for the graphic that you saw at the beginning of this episode. And until next week, get out and shoot!